Way of Vision. Okay, we got some good stuff today. I was talking to a guy after the first service. So cool. He, um, he's been coming about three weeks, and he was like hanging out with me and another guy talking and just kind of hanging out, hanging out. And when the one guy left, and he kind of still was hanging out, I'm like, anything else I can be, you know, talking about, whatever? And he said, man, since I've been coming here, God has been filling a void in me that I didn't realize I had. It's like, I mean, he, had, he was getting tears in his eyes. Like, this is a guy who was just invited by a guy who goes here and said, come and check it out. God's working at our church. And it's so cool that, honestly, that's in spite of me, in spite of our band, in spite of anything we got here, God is working at our church. So I encourage you in today's message, listen for him. All right, grab your takeaway card, like John said, or on your phone or tablet, get on the Bible app. And uh, as I always say, this, this time together is like a catalyst, okay? You're going to put in some notes, do some things, but I want you to take that takeaway card with you and to dig in the other verses I put on there, the different characters, the different passages. Spend time with God this week, unpacking what he has for you specifically out of this message and out of the series, because we're digging in a new series. And hey, when I told our creative team, do something with kingdoms, I did not realize like kingdoms, okay? Like they, they did them. We got kingdoms up here. And we got the invite cards, so definitely be passing those out, inviting people. Let's talk for about king for a minute about kings and kingdoms, because we all got different thoughts or images about that. Maybe you're a sports fan. You think kings, okay, we got, you know, the Sacramento Kings, we got the LA Kings. I like those sports. Or maybe you're a historian. You're thinking King Arthur in a round table, or King Tut in the mummies, or hey, maybe you're into music or racing. Have we got any fans in here of the king of rock and roll? Okay, come on now. If you like Elvis, stand up. For, I mean, don't stand up, but put your hand up for Elvis, okay? All right, and uh, really, are there any, like, old school, uh, you know, NASCAR fans in here like Richard Petty? I mean, really, you know, like, that's, that's king of racing, right? Okay, now how about, uh, oh, not too many kids in here. They're back in, in Trailblazer, but any, any Lion King fans in here? Oh, yes. oh, there we go. There we go. Show it with pride. You got that pride. Oh, lions, pride. Got you. Yep. And, uh, okay, and how about our students, Burger King? I mean, certainly, you guys like going over there, eating a Burger King, Put a little crown on and crazy. Now, also, you think about kings, you think about castles. Okay, anybody remember what's called the water around the castle? It's a moat. Aren't there some days when you really, you'd like to come up your driveway and just like pull it up and say, everybody stay away, I got a moat around my castle. Stay away, people I work with, people in the neighborhood, got my moat. Or other, other times, you just want to walk in there, don't you come and say, hey, me and my queen, we're just sitting on the thrones. Everybody just take care of us. Come on, I'm the king. This is my queen. And God looks at all that and says, okay. You think about kingdoms. Now, from here through Christmas, and actually even through the New Year's, we're going to talk about kingdoms. Today, we're talking about perspective, how there are different, two different kingdoms that are on a collision, and God wants us to have a kingdom perspective. We're going to unpack that today. Next week, make sure you don't miss it. We're talking about kingdom prayers, about how God, he wants us when we pray not to pray for little itsy bitsy things, but big kingdom things. And within that, there's power. There is kingdom power when we pray for things that God wants in his kingdom. In week three, it'll be Thanksgiving weekend, but make sure you don't miss it. If you're in town, bring family with you. We're talking about spiritual battle that day. And in this collision of kingdoms, really there's, there's some pain, but that God has a plan in that for us to win the spiritual battle. Then we're taking two weeks. The first week, we're going to talk to the ladies. So definitely the men, they'll be taking notes that day saying, see, sweet, Pastor Matt said, as a kingdom woman, you need to be like this. Well, then the next week, it flips over. We talk about kingdom man. But make sure you don't miss that as we talk to you, the women, then the men. And then December 18th, we have our big Christmas weekend. So make sure, promise this, if you got somebody in town, don't just say, well, we're, we're sleeping in. We got friends here. We're missing church. Bring them with you to church. It could possibly be our best Sunday of the year. We got oh, some music that day, some video stuff, some amazing things on December 18th. Where we'll be talking about Jesus who was born and rose into being the king of all time, December 18th. And then you can sleep in the next week, okay? Unless you got kids, because the next week is December 25th. You know, we're taking that one off, okay? We, we give our team two Sundays a year off, Christmas we're off, and then New Year's Day we'll wrap up the series before January 8th, which will be Blue Sunday. And if, you, if you're new here at Vision, we have a one-year anniversary each time, and this year is two years, and it'll be Blue Sunday on January 8th. You don't want to miss that. So the, the next month or two, we're going through kingdoms. Don't want you to miss that. And today, 
like John said, it's really interesting timing. With the election that just happened, and that we as a people kind of selected a new leader, just like, you know, putting somebody new on the throne, and there's some people happy about it, some people mad about it. But in general, we're thinking about leadership after what we saw this week. And God wants us thinking about leadership because, again, there's a collision of kingdoms, and he says, I have put a king on the throne, and he's fighting for you. And these kingdoms that are at war, let me tell you, it's, it's not Democrat, Republican. It's not rich or poor, black or white, men or women. Those are not the kingdoms at war. There is a collision between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. And God has got some great news for us. And let's take a look at Matthew 6 as they start digging into his word because Jesus, he was doing what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I want to encourage you, again, on the takeaway card, there's things to read this week. And when you get in there and read, don't just jump into Matthew 6. What I like to do is back up a couple chapters, start in Matthew 4, and read and see, what is Jesus talking about? And then Matthew 5, what's he talking about? And Matthew 6, what's he talking about? So when he gets to this verse and says, seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. He's saying, in every area of your life, seek God's kingdom. It's going to shape the way you think, shape the way you live, and there's great reward. The second piece of that, of righteousness, you're like, oh, Matt, that's such a, that's a churchy word. What's that mean? Man, righteousness, it means right standing. It means in a relationship, there is health. There is right standing. It's, it's good. So Jesus is saying, look, seek my kingdom in the way you think, and hey, let's build a relationship that's healthy. And then these things will be added. You're like, what things? I'm like, well, you get in there this week and look. Matthew 4, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, you look and see what he's talking about, about what things will be added as well. But today, we're looking all the way back for a minute to the Garden of Eden. And if you're new in church, you don't even know anything about the Bible, you probably at least have heard about the Garden. That many, many generations ago, there was this garden, there was Adam and Eve, and it, it was perfect. It was perfect. It's kind of like a, a swimming pool that's clear. Now, anybody in here, like, have a swimming pool, manage a swimming pool? Who, who are the guys in here that, like, clean the swimming pools? Yeah, I do. Okay. Now, you know what I say about swimming pools and horses and boats, okay? They're like money pits, all right? All three of them. And we got, you know, like an above-ground pool that uh, you know, we got from friends years ago, and they didn't, they didn't warn us, okay, <laughs> that, you know, this clear pool, you look at it, and it's kind of like the Garden of Eden that was perfect, untainted. You load a clear pool, and then one day you walk out there, and there's like, oh, it's starting to get a little cloudy. How do we deal with that? We put chemicals, or what, how do we fix that? Then you come out and say, oh, it's getting a little green. Or it gets worse. Your pool gets bad to where, like, you've lost it. And you got to decide, can we fix it with chemicals? Do we just dump it out? Do we just put a cover on it and just hope it goes away? And you think back to the Garden of Eden when it was clear and it was perfect. And it started getting tainted. And it got worse and worse to where I think most people would, would look at this last week in America and say this country that, honestly, that used to be a little more pure and a little more holy, and it's just messed up. It's getting dirtier and more sinful. So it's not a big stretch to say there's kingdoms battling against each other. So let's talk for a minute about what is the kingdom of God? What's the kingdom of God? Because you know, when you look at the Bible, honestly, sometimes things are hard to figure out. And I think sometimes God gives us clues. And other times we really need to sit and think critically to understand what is he talking about? So the kingdom of God, I want you to think about it in three terms. The first one is heaven. Heaven, a place that's perfect, a place that's, you know, up there somewhere, or when you die, you're going to go there someday. It's a place where God is. There's holiness. It's perfect. It's untainted. I think we can easily connect with that and say, okay, kingdom of God, heaven. I go there. The second piece, though, it's the church. This body of Christ, that God's desire for it is to be perfect and untainted, but the reality is it's filled with sinful people, so it's not perfect, but that God says, when people look at the church, I want them to see a glimpse of my kingdom. I want them to see people that love each other, that are open-handed and say, I will serve you, where there's forgiveness, where there's understanding, or say, I, I'll be a friend to you, even if you hadn't been a friend to me. There's a chance there for people to get a glimpse of God's kingdom in his church. The third one is in believers. And like John said, if you follow Christ, if you're a Christian, you're a believer, and that means people can see the kingdom of God through you. That truly, if you live your life different than the world, that you, honestly, you love people, you sacrifice, you serve, you give, and people look at you and say, man, what's different? 
And you wouldn't use these words, but you'd say, the kingdom of God is in me. That literally God lives in me and you can see that through me. I'm the kingdom of God. The church can be the kingdom of God and heaven is the kingdom of God. So when we're talking about the kingdom of God, that is moving against a force of evil. And God wants us to win in that battle. But let's talk about living under a king. Living under a king, like maybe back in the olden days, you go into a foreign country and there'd be a king and you could like wander through and say, I'm gonna decide whether to enter into that kingdom and live under that king. Well, the reality is, thinking logically, there's costs and there's benefits to doing that. There's two costs that I see. The first cost is you got to live by that king's agenda, right? You're entering into his kingdom. You're making a choice saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to go underneath your leadership. I'm going to follow your agenda. So the way you choose to lead your kingdom, I'm going to choose to live that way. The second thing, the reality is you're not the king, okay? I mean, man, it seems obvious, but truly the reality is somebody's on that throne and it's not you. So you have to make that choice whether you're going to enter into that kingdom, be underneath his agenda, and let him be the king and not you. Now, the good news, there's benefits. Okay, there's, there's three benefits that I see from coming underneath the leadership of a king. The first one, I love this, is protection. Because in my world, I know I need protection from the attacks that come my way. Okay, do you have anything in your week that happened? Show me with, like, with a hand or with fingers, like how how stressful your week was and you needed protection. So like one, not very stressful. 10, very stressful week. Okay, let, me, let me see, how stressful was your week? See, double hands, let's put another hand up there. Multiple. Okay, a lot of fingers means you needed a lot of protection. Now, if you're walking in here today saying, well, man, I'm, I'm not really believing in Jesus, let me be blunt, then he is not protecting you. If you don't enter into his kingdom, that king is not gonna give you his protection. But if you do choose to be underneath his leadership, the first benefit is his protection. The second one is his resources. And I love this because all the time, I'm seeing that I have limited resources. My mind, wisdom, my body's breaking down, my energy's falling apart. I'm like, okay, God, my resources are going down. Clearly, I need a king who has much greater resources than me. I want to fall underneath your leadership. It's worth it. The costs are worth it for the benefits I get, for the protection, for the resources, and for number three, for leadership, for leadership. That, you know, we talk all the time in our kids' ministry about making a wise choice. That takes a leader with wisdom. I've got some wisdom, but God's got all wisdom. I've got some power, he's got all power. He's the leader that I want to submit to. And you might say, man, I'm, I'm not submitting to anybody. It's fine, he's not gonna force you. But if you choose to enter into his kingdom, pay those costs, you will get those benefits of protection and resources and leadership. Let me promise you, if you're not there yet, it is worth it. It's worth it. So again, in Matthew 6, and Jesus said, seek first my kingdom. If you want to come into my kingdom, seek my kingdom and have right standing with me, there's gonna be a lot of benefits. There is gonna be a lot of benefit. Because there's a phrase that we're gonna keep on throughout this series. It says that there's a king and he's fighting for you. I love that concept. Because in my week, and evidently in your weeks, when you put these fingers up, and you're like, I'm feeling attacked. I'm feeling the heaviness of life. I need somebody fighting for me. I want somebody who's capable to fight for me. And so he's saying, I'm a king. I will fight for you. But, but get this. Say if you went into one of those, those distant lands up to a king, and you said, okay, I'm going to enter your kingdom. Most likely, you're not going to be able to get up you know, in his space. You're not going to sit at his table. You're probably not going to get in his oval office. You might even get into the castle because there's so many people. There's so many needs. And he's going to say, okay, I love you out there somewhere, but we're not really friends. Jesus, as a king, says, I will protect you and I will be your friend. Look at this in John 15. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. I want a king who's going to call me a friend. I want a king who I've, I've got his number. I know where he lives. I've got access to go sit down and eat and talk with him. That's the kind of king that I want to be with. Well, that leads to our bottom line for today. The bottom line said that God wants us to be aware of and live for his kingdom. He doesn't want you to say, well, that's, that's kind of nice. I mean, that's, that's really a neat prop and 
cool logo. And that's, that's interesting about a king, Pastor Matt talking about a kingdom. God's saying, no, tomorrow, when you go to work and school and you're at your family, he said, I want you to be aware of this kingdom and live for it. Well, you say, Matt, how, how do I do that? Well, I've identified what I call kind of the big three. The first one is in your time that you literally would say, God, I'm going to be open-handed and give you my time. That whatever your kingdom is going to ask of me with my time, I'm going to give it. That when, when I can tell somebody they need someone to listen to, they need someone to talk to, they need someone to, to invest in them, I'll give some of my time. Or, God, really spend a couple of minutes with you reading or praying, I'll give you my time. Basically, you'll take your priorities and line them up according to this king in your time. The second one is in your money. And you're like, oh man, Pastor Matt's asking about money again. John already asked for our money. What are we talking about money? Look, I'm not talking at all about you giving your money. I'm talking about something way bigger than giving to a church or either even tithing to a church. This is about everything that you own, which honestly, you don't own it. And I think you know this. If you show up in a hospital or you end up in jail or you can't even get out of bed, you're like, wait a second. It's just a gift to get out of bed. It's just a gift even to have a dollar to spend. God, thank you for giving me a chance to steward any money at all. So let me ask you to consider then with your money that you would say, God, how would you want me to use my money for your kingdom? What would that look like? And then the third one in the big three is relationships. That, you know, in our lives, a lot of tension can come from relationships. A lot of great feelings can come from relationships. And God says, let me be right in the middle of those. So as you consider your friendships, as you consider who you talk to, as you consider even at school who you might sit with or walk with in the hallway with or give a ride to, that you'd say, God, for your kingdom's sake, how would you like me to align my relationships for your kingdom? And this, this king who has all these benefits to give you, I believe he'll open up the floodgates and say, look, you're aligning your time, your money, your relationships according to my kingdom. I'm going to pour blessings on you. Well, this king is also known as being a prince. And seeing all these fingers up, I'm thinking, you guys need more peace. Honestly, you need some more peace in your world. And Jesus said that he is the prince of peace. Look at this verse in Isaiah 9, which we hear a lot during the Christmas season. But this verse is real for you every day when it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So repeat that after me. Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Prince of peace. Oh, man. It, to think that you have a leader, a king who will welcome you to his table, into his castle, across his drawbridge, and he'll give you peace. He'll say, I'll, I'll meet you this week when you're feeling the weight of life on you. I'll meet you this week when you got a void in you that you don't know really what to do about. I'll meet you there because I'm a prince of peace. That relationship that's falling apart, that thing that you know about that's scaring you, he said, I'll meet you there and be your prince of peace. So indeed, he is fighting for you. And the next step I want you to take, I'm asking you, is that you would ask Jesus as your king, he wants you to manage Big three for him. He's saying, this week, think about my kingdom, this collision that's happening. Take the next step of talking to me and listening to me about the big three with your time, with your money, with your relationships. I want to meet you there and help you figure that out. He will fight for you on your takeaway card. You can see, I gave you some passages to look at this week. Some guys from the Old Testament. First guy's Joshua. He's in this battle and it is not looking good. And he asked God, I said, God, please fight for me. Help me out. And I bet you those words probably sound familiar because you probably have said them sometime in the last 30 days. And he said, God, please help me out. And it says that surely God was fighting for Joshua. How about this guy Gideon? You can look up his story. And in that one, his resources are going from here to here to here. And he's like, God, that's not enough. I can't do it with that. And God says, with me fighting for you, that's more than enough. There's a guy named Elijah. And in his, he's facing an attack that looks impossible to win. He is going up against vicious people in a vicious situation. They say, you can't possibly make it. He says, God, will you help me make it? And he makes it. God's fighting for him. Now, let me tell you a story. This guy named John Newton. And you probably 
you probably hadn't heard of him. And, and actually, before I start a story, if you would pick up, pick up your blue connection card. And with this connection card, I want you to give me a little bit of information. I want you to take 20 seconds now and write your name and either your phone number or your email, whatever you're comfortable with. Write that on your connection card. All right, now your connection card, you can keep writing it even during the story. But I want you to think about this guy. His name is John Newton, and he was born back in the 1700s. This guy, John, when he grew up in London, and he didn't really realize about collision of kingdoms, but his mom did speak into him and said, look, John, there is a God. And as a young boy, you, know, you can't really grasp the concept of collision of kingdoms, but you can grasp that life is a battle. And John's mom, he said, look, Jesus is the true king. Well, John's mom, she died when he was six or seven years old, crushed. His dad was a captain on a merchant ship. So he's out there traveling on the ship. And finally, John realized, well, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and just, just join him in that. So at age 11, he joins him on this ship. Starts sailing the seas, awful conditions, awful work. And John's like, this this is not what I want to do as an 11-year-old, 12-year-old. So he actually, he tries to what they call desert the ship and leave. Well, he gets caught and he's brought back to the ship where he's locked up, he's beaten, he's abused. He has to stay on this ship in conditions that are terrible. It's awful. Now, even though his dad is the leader of the ship, John has no freedom. He has no life. Now, the, the story continues and, event, and one day they come up against a, a slave ship and he begs them, like, just please trade me. Give me away something. And they do. They trade him. So now he's on a slave ship. The slave ship keeps sailing. He's cha shackled, chained up. They land on an island. He goes into this, this possession of an awful slave trader, beaten, abused, hopeless. But one day, the slave trader gets him back on a ship, out there sailing, and kind of miraculously, I guess you would say it's amazing, he comes in, in, in touch with another ship where the captain knew his dad. And the captain's like, John Newton was your dad? Th that other leader of that ship? He's like, yeah, that, that was my dad. And the guy, in, in amazing, says, okay, I, I will buy you out of your slavery so you can come with me on my ship. I mean, grace shown to him, whew, amazing. Now, he gets on this ship, starts sailing with this other guy to where he gets like basically a new chance on life. Now, great, his, his mom's died. He's been abused. He's been in slavery. He's been abused again. Really, his life has stunk. But now he's on this ship. He actually starts rising up in leadership to where he eventually becomes the captain of a ship. So many years later, he's, he's sailing the seas. And I wonder how many times he would, he would stand on the deck and look at the stars or watch the waves. Would he ever think back to his mom? And when she talked about this collision of kingdoms, and one day there's this violent storm. He's on the deck, terrible storm, the kind of storm that should tear up a ship and everybody would drown. So he's on this ship in this terrible storm. And I think he clearly remembers what mom said now 40, 50 years ago. And he cries out, he says, God, I've lived far from you all my life. In fact, I've lived for my kingdom all my life. Maybe he didn't use those words, but his heart was saying, I'm ready to consider you being my king. And he stood on that deck in these crashing waves and said, God, if you will save me in this moment, I will live for you the rest of my life. And in God's grace, the storm does eventually subside. And John says, okay, I'm, I'm living for you. And they, they, they sail into port and he gets off the ship and says, I'm never getting on a ship again. I'm telling people about Jesus. So he becomes a pastor. He's in a little church. He's telling people about Jesus, about this grace that he felt from the king. And they're in this little church, and it keeps growing. It grows so much, they had to expand it. They're, they're building out, expanding it. And this, you know, this is 1800s, and they're seeing God work. Well, they meet every Sunday, and they also meet once a week for like a prayer meeting. And at the prayer meetings, he would bring in a new hymn. Him and his buddy would kind of write, and they'd bring it in, and sometimes they'd read it, sometimes they'd sing it. And so one week he brings one in and they start singing Amazing Grace. And little did he know that now, years later, 
it would be truly the most popular hymn of all time. That the heart in that message of standing on a deck in a storm saying, God, I need some type of grace. And if you would give it, it would be amazing. He wrote this song and it's carried on through generations to us. So here's my ask to you. Pick up your blue connection card. And this is, this is private. So this is like, this is you and God. And I want you to think about two questions. The first one is in regard to Jesus, would you say he's your king? I got you four choices. Either yes, no. Today I want him to become my king or I still got some questions on that. And so I'm asking you to be authentic and to jot that down. Hey, if you don't want me to have your number, your email, that's fine. If you don't even know your name, then put your initials. But something, you put it on there. It says, God, here's kind of where me and you stand. And then close that thing up. So you, your wife doesn't see it. No one around you sees it. That's you and God. Well, open it back up for a second. Because the second question is about how I can pray for you. Because in the big three, I'm going to be praying for you. If you put down there, man, pray for me in, in my time that truly I would think of God's kingdom with my time or with my money or with my relationships. Put it on there and I will take those. And in privacy, I'll talk with our care team and say, hey, will you join me in praying for some of these people that have asked us to pray for them in these areas? And if you put on there about Jesus and more questions or Jesus and no, cool. We'll help you out any way we can. 